Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, as a few remaining stragglers will, will join us here. Uh, welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the History and Public Policy Program uh, here, and it's a, a pleasure, as always, to co-chair um, this Washington History Seminar session um, with Professor Eric Arneson from George Washington University. The seminar, as uh, many of you are familiar, uh, as many of you know, uh, represents a <coughs> joint venture of um, the National History Center, represented here by Dane Kennedy, um, and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. And we're delighted uh, today to have uh, uh, a terrific, uh, distinguished uh, speaker with Professor Jeremy Suri on his new book on the Impossi Impossible Presidency, The Rise and Fall of America's Highest Office. <clears throat> we have dedicated the first session each year in the Washington History Seminar lineup to William Roger Lewis, um, who is here with us today, care professor of English History and Culture at the University of Texas, Austin, um, to recognize both his contributions to the National History Center as its uh, former, uh, its founding uh, director, um, as well as um, uh, his role in co-founding uh, this activity, the Washington History Seminar, some seven years ago. And uh, here we are, seven years later, with uh, 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 170 folks uh, coming today, and uh, uh, last week, in fact, we had an, uh, one out of the order a session with Arne Vestad with 250 um, folks from around town. So this activity has um, really grown into a major, uh, major operation and event, and um, we're indebted to Roger uh, for his support and his vision and his ongoing support um, of both institutions and especially uh, the seminar. Um, let, <laughs> and we're particularly privileged because today his wife Dagma also joins us. So Dagma, a warm welcome from all, us, all of us up here. Before I uh, turn it over to Eric to introduce um, our speaker today, dear friend and longtime partner, um, uh, let me just uh, remind uh, all of you that um, we're always uh, uh, happy to add to the donor base for this particular <laughs> activity. Um, we uh, do receive funds from the um, Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. Um, uh, they are, uh, they're dwindling funds, so we're, we're ever eager to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, have support from all of you. Um, there's actually a, um, some information on how to become a contributor on the back of the, the program uh, page outside, so feel free to, to pick that up. Uh, we also <clears throat> want to re uh, recognize the support of the George Washington University History Department that also generously supports this, uh, this, this seminar, as well as a number of um, anonymous donors. Uh, among which we hope we can count many of you <laughs> soon enough. Uh, let me also say that um, uh, these activities don't organize themselves, and um, I want to uh, do a shout out and thanks to uh, my colleague here, Peter Bierstrecker in the back, and Amanda Perry at the National History Center, um, who really put uh, uh, take on the, the ha do the heavy lifting in terms of the organization of this event. Uh, let me also point out that next week, September 18th, um, um, we have Melissa Stockdale here on mobilizing the Russian nation, patriotism and citizenship in the First World War, um, and hope you can join us for that, as well as uh, several of the other um, uh, seminars, Mondays, as always, at 4 o'clock. With that, Eric, your Thank floor. You. Thank you, Christian. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Jeremy Surrey, who holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, where he's also a professor of history and public affairs. He is a leading scholar of American politics, American social change, and international affairs. 
He has written or edited nine books. I won't list them all. Uh, but among them are Henry Kissinger and the American Century and Liberty's Surest Guardian, American Nation Building from the Founders to Obama. His most recent book, which we'll hear about today, is The Impossible Presidency, The Rise and Fall of America's Highest Office, uh, a book that was published what? Today? Yesterday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> but it does exist, and you can get a copy. Um, so that's the newest book, and that's the topic of today's conversation. Professor Suri is also a frequent contributor to major newspapers and magazines, including such journals as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, um, the Washington Quarterly, Wired, uh, War on the Rocks, Fortune, and other outlets. Uh, he is a popular public lecturer, appearing often on television and radio news shows, and his research and teaching uh, have uh, received numerous awards in 2007. The Smithsonian Magazine named him uh, as one of America's, quote unquote, top young innovators. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter, uh, at Jeremy Surrey. Uh, Jeremy. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, the, the book actually comes out tomorrow, uh, but when I was given the opportunity to give the William Roger Lewis uh, presentation here, I couldn't say no. Uh, William Roger Lewis, I've known since I was a graduate student at Yale, in fact, and he's been a a model and an inspiration for me for a long time. So uh, I know we already uh, gave him a round of applause, but I think we should do it again. For <laughs> now maybe he'll vote the way I want him to vote in faculty meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we live in a time of presidential crisis. That's obvious. Uh, I didn't start this book, though, when we were in this moment. Uh, all of us in this audience who have written books know that we start a book in a particular moment and the book comes out in another moment. Uh, I began this book, actually I began thinking about this book six years ago and working on it uh, forcefully and with much of my time about four and a half, five years ago. Uh, and it was a very different uh, America uh, at the time. But even then it was clear as we were dealing with the first of what became many debt ceiling crises and the first of many government shutdowns uh, that we faced a real crisis. Um, and it's now become much more acute. But it seems to me that fundamentally, the world we've been living in for more than a decade is a world where the demands upon the presidency have continued to grow, but the governing capacity of the presidency seems to have declined. So more is asked, more is expected, more is promised. Um, sometimes contradictory things promised at the same time. Uh, but yet it seems so difficult for presidents to get anything done. Uh, I think that is one issue that both Barack Obama and uh, Donald Trump will agree on, that both of them came into office and found it much more difficult than they imagined it would be. That's not a new refrain for presidents, but I think it's a problem that's grown worse. And the point of departure for my book is to understand historically how we came to this moment. How is it that over time, as Arthur Schlesinger wrote more than a generation ago, the presidency has become an imperial office and if you look at the trappings of the office, it's more and more imperial, without the crown, of course, but I think Donald Trump will create one soon. Uh, the office has become more imperial, uh, but the actions, the outcomes, the consequences, after a certain moment in our history, seem to go in the other uh, direction. I think what uh, Arthur Schlesinger got wrong, writing in the time of Nixon, was actually that the limitations on this imperial presidency actually grew greater than the growth of the power of the presidency at the same time. And so my book seems to, seeks to understand this. I think it's important that we understand this history because it can take us to a useful place, which I'll come back to at the end of my talk, where we're not just arguing about the person, but talking more about the office. The problems of the presidency, the problems of leadership in our country will not be solved even if tomorrow we get the perfect person, whoever that would be. And one of the problems we faced, I believe, is that we are looking for personality to solve for structure. And there's a structural problem in the office that I'm going to describe that even the most qualified, most prepared, most moral, most uh, public interested individual would have trouble solving. And of course we don't have that now. I think the biggest point that I want to start with is a point about size, and I'm going to come back to this, but I want to start with this and put this uh, front and center because it's a topic we as historians have had trouble talking uh, about. We narrate growth, 
we narrate increase in size, especially those of us who study American foreign relations. There is a constant narrative toward more, more military power, more wealth, more uh, reach. Uh, but what we don't struggle enough with are the problems of gigantism, the problems of managing so much growth, the problems of being so large, and the ways in which size and scope distorts behavior. Size and scope distorts behavior. This is an old argument that Roger, of course, will recognize from Paul Kennedy and many others. And it's an argument that I think applies to thinking about the presidency. The studies of the presidency, written by other wonderful presidential historians, tend to miss this because they study pre presidents individually and focus on character and focus appropriately on their individual behavior outside of the context of the larger structure of American policymaking. What I'm saying, in other words, is that most presidential biographies are not studies of policy. So you see the character of the individual, not the problems of the structure the individual is in. And so my effort in this book is to put the long history of the presidency in context to see how the structure of the office has affected the individuals, just as the individuals have changed the structure of the office and to see ultimately how the growth in size has distorted the office far from its origins. It's not to say we should go back to its origins, but it is to say that the place we are in now is a far departure from the expectations, hopes, and even the democratic assumptions surrounding the office. And I'll close with some ideas about where we could go forward, but I'll be honest at first and say that as a historian, I think I'm a little bit better at, a, at diagnosing the problem than offering a cure. And my wife would say, this is how I approach everything. <laughs> I have criticisms and explanations for all problems. Don't ask me to solve them. Uh, I do have some ideas. I do think we can only begin to address the problems and move forward with something like solutions uh, if we know this history. And in fact, the point here is that, in fact, we don't know our presidential history. We know about presidents, but we don't know the history of the presidency. I begin the book uh, after an introduction by talking about the founding and the creation of the presidency. And I'm not a colonial historian, but this is a fascinating story that we would all benefit from returning to. Uh, and my research here is not necessarily original, but I think it's research and drawing on work that's often been forgotten in recent writings, especially by scholars of foreign relations. Uh, the creation of the presidency was the most uncertain and least agreed upon part of the Constitutional Convention. People knew the sides in the slavery debate on the presidency, the debate is all over the place. The founders did not know what they were creating, and they did not have agreement on what the presidency should be. In fact, as far as we can tell, they expected that the House of Representatives would end up choosing presidents. Their expectation, as occurred in 1800 and in 1824, was that favorite sons would present themselves, no one would get enough electoral votes, you'd have four candidates, and it would go to the House of Representatives. That is actually the expectation they had. It shows you how far off they were. And it's humbling for anyone who thinks original intent should guide the way that we operate, because then we would be so far away from that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest, when I read the Bush v. Gore decision, I wonder what original intent. Uh, they're talking about the, the, uh, the founders had no sense that office would go in this way. They expected the presidency to remain small. They gave the president no staff. They gave the president no budget. They gave the president none of the accoutrement of a king. But. They expected the president to serve certain unifying monarchical functions. As James Madison actually put it, the president was to be a democratic patriotic king. And of course, that's contradictory. The idea was that this office would provide unification, would provide a way of bringing the country together, would be an office that would focus the country on key issues and help define what it meant to be American. And that is, of course, as everyone knows, why George Washington did not join any party. And the presumption was that presidents would be above party, another area where the presumptions of the founders were entirely off. What the founders struggled with in Article II was how to define what this person should do. Should the president actually be a day-to-day -day policymaker? Should the president be a military leader? He's commander in chief, but they did not expect him to do day-to-day -day military management. What should the president do? And in fact, they threw a lot into this small office. So as Clinton Rossiter wrote 30 years ago in what I still think is one of the best books on the presidency, 
Uh, the president is defined as about 25 different jobs. He came up with 25 different responsibilities the president has. None of them does he have full authority in or resources, but all of them he is to achieve at the same time. And it was thrown together as such. Washington, of course, creates the mold. But Washington as president, in contrast to the uh, play Hamilton, which I love, Washington did not spend his time mediating in cabinet debates between uh, Jefferson and Hamilton. Washington spent his time doing what the founders expected him to do, to go around and unify the country. And you can all read his diary online and see him doing this. And his farewell address is actually more about this than anything else. The presidency in its first format, in its first form, was not defined by the Constitution. It was defined by the unifying actions of George Washington to bring a country together that was filled with people who did not think of themselves as Americans, but thought of themselves as citizens of Massachusetts, Virginia, Georgia, and the frontier, which included places like Wisconsin and not even Texas at that time. Texas wasn't even part of, their, part of the United States yet, of course. So this is the first notion of the presidency. Andrew Jackson transforms the office, of course. That's the next part of my book by bringing the presidency to the frontier. If Washington is unifying the country, what Jackson saw himself democratizing the presidency. And we have a lot of wonderful scholarship on this. What did this mean? It meant significantly expanding the office to reach into the lives of people on the frontier who were not touched by the office, in particular through Indian killing. There's no way to talk about Andrew Jackson without that. Jackson saw the presidency as creating land opportunities for people like himself, born in the Carolinas, who did not have land, immigrants without land who had to move west. And the presidency was going to help secure the land for them. He saw Henry Clay and others as impediments to that process. So he was not creating less government. He didn't even talk about it that way. He was using government more to provide for opportunity for those on the frontier. So he creates a much more expansive, much more violent, some see it as democratic, others as genocidal, it's some of both uh, elements of the presidency. It is an expanded presidency upon which, of course, Abraham Lincoln will then build. And one of the other points I try to make in the book is how, how every generation in this first century, century and a half, builds the office on the actions of the one before them, of the transformational president before them. So the office accretes. It is not defined statutorily. It is defined in precedent and behavior as one builds on the other. The path dependence of the office matters much more than the statutory authority of the office. If we went by statute, the president wouldn't look the way it did. The presidency wouldn't look the way it did. So Lincoln, who I spend a lot of time on in the book, everyone who, starts, who studies Lincoln is drawn into Lincoln, of course. Lincoln not only fights a war to unify the country, he does, I think, the most extraordinary thing in transforming the presidency. He uses a war, and he's the first of many presidents to do this, to fundamentally rebuild the country. So if Washington unifies the country, I argue that Abraham Lincoln is the first nation builder. And as I actually argued in a prior book, he creates some of the first agencies of American nation building, the Freedmen's Bureau and others, which become models for American activity in the Philippines and elsewhere. But well beyond that, uh, so much of Lincoln's domestic policy is also his foreign policy here. The Homestead Act of 1862, passed during the Civil War, takes Jackson one more step. Uh, the president does what he has no authority to do, really, in the Constitution. He takes federal land and decides who's going to get it. Gives the land to settlers. He didn't even have to be a citizen. I like to remind people who are concerned about immigration restrictions and how we've always policed our borders, that actually under the Homestead Act, you didn't even have to be a citizen. You could be an immigrant. If you went and lived as a family, it presumed a family unit, you lived on the land for five years, farm that land, it could be yours. You didn't even have to be a citizen for this. That's federal land that Lincoln appropriates in that way. The Morrill Land Grant, which actually began as legislation, of course, before his presidency, not only does he support the Morrill Land Grant, he actually funds it beyond what had been expected in providing land to all Union states for the creation of public universities. And just to get this history straight, most people uh, get this wrong. The universities are not built on the land. The land is sold to create cash to endow the universities, to pay the professors' salaries. The story of endowments for chairs begins actually then, believe it or not. The Morrill Land Grant specifically defines the purpose of public universities as providing open educational access to farmers and ordinary citizens, they mean white male citizens in most cases, but not entirely, 
um, and education in the mechanical and liberal arts. The liberal arts is in the statute. The liberal arts is in the statute. Um, I always remind my engineering colleagues uh, of, of, of that, that the liberal arts are actually in the statute. Lincoln's dream, as uh, a man educated for only about two years, who nonetheless mastered the English language as no one else in the presidency ever has. Lincoln's dream was that every farmer would learn to be a better farmer and also read Shakespeare. That was Lincoln's uh, dream. And he made that a reality. Uh, the Civil War, as Charles Beard had argued years ago, was over slavery, but it was also over what kind of nation we would have. What would be the political economy of the nation? Would we be a nation of landholders with uh, slave labor, or would we be a nation of free labor, free soil, free men? Free labor, free soil, free men. And boy, oh boy, was Lincoln significant in that, because there were many others, even on the Union side, who did not fully buy into that vision. If you pull Lincoln out, or if you have someone else elected in 1864, you do not have that consequence to this. And what I argue in my chapter is that Lincoln actually also created the language for this, that his use of language actually created a, de a definition, a self-identity for Americans that became inclusive, not for all, but inclusive and defining in the way that no other president had before. I, I just have to say this. It's humbling to spend a lot of time reading Lincoln and realize uh, how little he was educated and how well he used the English language. It is said that Churchill mobilized the English language for war. I think Lincoln transformed the English language to build a nation. And I love going to Lincoln Memorial and seeing that in action every day, especially now, especially now. Theodore Roosevelt built on this. Uh, if Washington used the presidency to unify, and Jackson used the presidency to connect with frontier settlers and offer them opportunity, and Lincoln created a modern capitalist economy with free labor, free soil, free men. Theodore Roosevelt used the office to create a push for progressive reform. I think he was the great progressive president. Wilson has claimed to that a bit. But Wilson's defense of racism, Wilson's defense of separation, Wilson's defense of certain anti-progressive ideas makes it hard to really label him in that way. Theodore Roosevelt, though not free of many of these limitations, really saw himself as the reformer in chief. And it's, it, it's breathtaking uh, and often lost when people write about Theodore Roosevelt how much of a muckraker he was, how many issues from antitrust uh, to uh, helmets in football that he actually uh, supported. This was a man who sought to use the presidency, as he said, and I quote him in the book, as an intellectual dictator to the country. <laughs> and as his critics said, he had dictatorial tendencies. But he saw the office as an enlightening, progressive office. That is not to say this was in any way completely inclusive nor free of flaw, but it was another expansion of the office in that direction. That build brings us to really the hero of the book and also the villain. Uh, the big chapter in the middle of the book is on Franklin Roosevelt, uh, who I call the national healer. Franklin Roosevelt, I think, is the last great president. He's the last president to really build the modern office and master it, and every other president has suffered uh, thereafter. Roosevelt saw and understood the growth in the office and saw the problems confronting American society and had a remarkable vision for those problems despite his own elite background. And, and I have to tell the story, I, I tell it in the book, it's, it, it still stays with me. I, I read thousands and thousands of oral histories, as many of you have, uh, from the New Deal. There's so many and they're so wonderful and so enlightening to read. I now actually just assign the oral histories to my undergraduates, to tell you the truth. They're better than anything I can do to describe the Depression. Steinbeck and the oral histories are what, are what I use. Uh, but the one that stays with me uh, is the one from Saul Bellow, uh, the great novelist, uh, who describes uh, his life growing up in Chicago. And Bellow describes how, uh, as a Russian Jewish immigrant to Chicago, he learned very early on, as he says, uh, all politicians are crooks. Chicago, that's true, right? Uh, <laughs> my wife grew up in Chicago. We often kid with her, right? You get elected governor, and then you go to jail, basically, in Chicago. <laughs> Bello describes uh, a day, it's not clear whether he means 1934, 35, it's sometime around that period, uh, when he had left the University of Wisconsin because he couldn't afford to pay his tuition anymore, and he's walking 
through Chicago. He describes all these walks he would take as a young unemployed man in Chicago. And uh, he sees all the cars pulled over on the, the, on, on the highway. And um, they're all listening to the radio. And he describes how he hears this, this funny voice. And he says, uh, this was the first politician who, even though he sounded strange, talked to me. He understood me. He empathized. That, that, that's FDR's great skill. He wasn't a policy genius. He was uh, the great empathizer. Uh, and, and I really want to make this point. I, I probably state it too strongly in the book. Uh, uh, but I think there's a total misconception in policymaking circles, and part of my life is in the LBJ School of Public Affairs, that policy is about telling people what the solutions to their problems is. And that's not what policy is at all. Policy is helping people find the solutions to their problems by helping them know you understand and willing to help them find the solutions to their problems. That's what FDR did. FDR provided a sense of empathy. People felt connected to him. Saul Bellow's story is told thousands of times in the oral histories. Now, not everyone liked FDR. We shouldn't pretend there was a moment of great consensus when everyone agreed. But certainly he made the president part of people's lives as no other president had been before. But the problem with that, the problem with that is that it did create a much more monstrous office at home and abroad than ever before. So when FDR came into office, when FDR came into office, his staff was about three people, his direct staff, which he expanded greatly. When he left office, the presidency was the beginnings of the gargantuan office you know today. Or Washington, D.C. is another way to think about this. The city we're in right now was a small village until the New Deal. And look around at some of the architecture from that period. It's the architecture of the New Deal that transforms Washington, D.C. So I thought I'd read two paragraphs here. My editor keeps telling me I'm supposed to read part of the book. People don't want to hear me read, but all right. So here are two paragraphs and how I try to summarize some of what I'm saying here about Roosevelt, which is a fulcrum for my argument. The Roosevelt presidency was a leviathan civilized, in Saul Bellow's words, by the character of the man in charge and the constitutional structure he worked within. Roosevelt's personal commitment to decency, democracy, and cooperation disciplined the powers he harnessed for the benefit of millions of citizens. Many people, however, remained left out. Roosevelt's critics represented groups that did not share the benefits and also recognized the danger in the powers the president had amassed. Charles Beard, a distinguished and prescient historian and commentator, resisted what he viewed as the overweening and often unchecked powers of a president who dominated the economy, war, and many other elements of society. Such a president looked more and more like a dictator than the dispassionate and distant figure embodied by Washington. Roosevelt carried the presidency far from its 18th century origins, and he was not the only one. My point is there's a progression of historical circumstances that do this, which made it more attractive, the presidency, to citizens like Bellow, but also more threatening to principal Democrats like Beard. The critics were prescient. Roosevelt built the post-war presidency, the one we still have today, and he was the last to master it. His successors would find themselves struggling to manage an office that more often managed them. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. Extraordinary power not only corrupts, it encourages distraction, hubris, narcissism, and excess, all the qualities of American presidential leadership since World War II in different forms for different presidents. Good men followed Roosevelt in the presidency. I think most of our presidents have been good men and talented men. I think when you study the history of the office, when you study the history of any policymakers, you find they're generally hardworking, good people. Not always, but generally. Good men followed Roosevelt in the presidency, but none of them accomplished nearly as much, even though each worked equally as hard, if not harder. The problem for Roosevelt's successors was too much power, too much responsibility, and too much temptation. Roosevelt was the last great president because the office was still small enough for him to control it, just barely, just barely. After him, the continued increase in presidential power exceeded executive capacity, exceeded government capacity. The office grew to serve suffering humanity in the mid-20th century, but it ultimately became impossible in its scale and scope. That was the dilemma that undid Roosevelt's deeply frustrated successors and the citizens who elected them. So Roosevelt 
in a sense, benefits from the culmination of 150 years of growth in the power of the presidency, but the office still being small enough that that growth in power can be managed by one person. And my argument is, as in all of our lives, you reach a point where there's just too much, too much for anyone to manage. And our model of the great leader who brings people together and masters the policy and rules the world and solves people's problems at home becomes actually an impossible endeavor with the responsibility that now comes with that on a global scale and with the depth of domestic responsibility. So as the scale widens globally, it also deepens domestically as a consequence of Roosevelt, the New Deal, and World War II. And we have not grappled with that. We have looked for presidents to master the unmasterable. I speak in a, you know, write in another chapter about uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson in exactly these terms. And um, this was a particularly fun chapter to write about uh, because for all the things written about Kennedy and Johnson, uh, one of the things historians have actually spent very little time on are their calendars, how they organize their time. And in the book, uh, uh, for your reading enjoyment, I uh, include uh, facsimiles, images of their calendars and compare them with Roosevelt's. And um, I encourage you to take a look if I had PowerPoint to put it up. But Roosevelt's calendar actually looks like a daytimer's calendar, if you all remember a desk, desktop daytimer's calendar. And Missy Lehan writes things in. And there's a lot of open time. There's a lot of open space. There's a lot of spontaneity. There's a lot of flexibility in Roosevelt's calendar. And Truman's looks kind of similar. And Eisenhower's a little bit. John F. Kennedy is the breaking point. His calendars are typed, prepared days in advance, organized down to 30-minute intervals. Roosevelt's were in hour intervals, and they are structured. So, as I described, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, something missed in most of the scholarship on the Cuban Missile Crisis, for that first week, Kennedy has incredible difficulty even getting into the XCOM meetings. We assume he creates XCOM, and he's going to be sitting in these meetings deliberating. In fact, because it's secret that the missiles have been found, he has to keep to his schedule which means he has barely any time to get into those meetings, and he says this himself. The day he's briefed on the missiles is the day he has the uh, king of Libya in town. And he laments, I've got to spend time with the whole retinue of the king of Libya when this is going on, right? The president is responsible as head of state for entertaining people. Roosevelt never had to entertain. He has to deal with domestic negotiations and issues Roosevelt never dealt with. He has to deal with a range of issues that constrain his calendar and make it very difficult from Kennedy's time forward to focus on what really matters, even in the eyes of the president himself. Same is true for Lyndon Johnson's calendar, but on steroids. Um, Lyndon Johnson's calendar not only is down to the minute, uh, they now put phone calls on there because he does much of his work by phone. And what you realize is he has webbed things, at the same meeting, or different meetings with the same people at the same time. And what I never realized until I looked at the calendar is he will often have an advisor in his office, like Joe Califano, start the meeting, start talking to someone else, and poor Joe Califano will sit in his office all day <laughs> waiting to get back to that meeting. Right? So he's got meetings nestled within one another, totally pulled off focus. So the day he sends or authorizes American forces to go to Da Nang, the beginnings of American combat operations uh, in Vietnam, he's also dealing with George Wallace and Selma. He's dealing with uh, de Democratic campaign, demand, campaign contribution demands, and he's dealing with uh, congressional infighting within the Democratic Party, all at the same time, all meetings going on precisely at the same moment. This is indiscipline, certainly, on his part, but it's also more the model of what the presidency becomes. What we miss as scholars of policy is as we are separating the policy issues off, we don't realize the overlap that shouldn't be there that is there in the reality of policymaking. And what presidential biographers miss is they miss the chaos of it because it all in the retelling of the president seems so ordered. And it's incredibly, incredibly chaotic as such. And what you see, I think, from Kennedy and Johnson on is a dynamic where presidents are reactive more than leading. So here's the paradox with someone with Kennedy's forceful leadership rhetoric. And in reality, the practice of power is far more reactive than it's ever been before. He has problems coming to him every day that he cannot deal with or comprehend, and his goal is simply to get them off his desk. Push them away. Push them away. Same to some extent with uh, Lyndon Johnson. For Ronald Reagan, who I spent a lot of time studying and writing about, this is a really interesting story because I think Reagan actually understood this problem. I think Reagan's insight 
was actually that trying to do too much creates overstretch. Uh, so Reagan actually understood, but he fell into this as well. Even though he cut back on his calendar, and I show some of his calendars in the book, even though he guarded his time, went to bed early, he was early to bed every night, preserved time for himself, he found as his presidency went on that issues kept coming to him he did not want to come to him. And he continually made thoughtless choices about them. Or, to put it other ways, choices that were based upon his pre-existing thoughts rather than analysis of the information that was too much for him to master. You could argue that he might not have had the capacity to master as much as other presidents. But I would say to you that for some issues, he did master a lot of information, such as dealing with the Soviet Union, which I'm sure Arne talked about, and I'm sure Bill Taubman will talk about when he's here. But what Reagan was unable to do was for the other major issues that came to his plate, differentiate what mattered and what didn't matter, and gain the knowledge he needed to make effective policy when it really mattered. This is the story of Iran-Contra, which I think he's far more um, culpable for than often said. Malcolm Bryan has, has done a wonderful book uh, along these lines. Uh, Reagan really wanted to free the hostages, and he really wanted to aid the Contras, and he told his staff to do that. Didn't realize what the consequences would be when he said that. Franklin Roosevelt could say things like that, and things wouldn't happen. Uh, in a national security establishment as such, with as large a set of offices and a large, as many powers as the president had, saying that triggered a set of events that produced an outcome far different from what Reagan fully understood or spent the time or had the time to think and realize. And I spend a lot of time in the chapter also on AIDS, um, an issue that many scholars of Reagan, especially his defenders, seem to want to forget. Um, the president was briefed countless times, including by his own Surgeon General, on the problems of AIDS and saw it, didn't differentiate how that was an important issue from the other issues he was dealing with. It was not only his personal prejudice surrounding the issue, it was his inability to prioritize or to understand the importance of that issue when thousands of people were dying, even after his friend uh, Rock Hudson had passed away. And by the way, um, I, I, this I'm now reporting on work my graduate students did for me who know how to do stuff I don't know how to do. Uh, we actually measured the amount of time Reagan spent in meetings and compared it with the amount of time Harry Truman spent in meetings. Uh, this is just meeting time. I don't know how much this data actually reveals, but it's just worth saying something about it. Reagan spent twice as much time in meetings as Harry Truman. That's counterintuitive if you think of all the things Truman did. It's counterintuitive if you think of our image of Reagan. Presidents take less vacation in the second half of the 20th century. When they go on vacation, the whole Oval Office goes with them. They don't get away. They lose perspective. They don't prioritize. And I think that's the story of Clinton and Obama. My chapter on Clinton and Obama, uh, I think, actually manifests many of the problems we see today. I think these are very, two very different people from our current president. But like our current president, they felt they were elected uh, with some super skill, some magic touch. They had gone through life that way, uh, both from very disadvantaged families, both without fathers growing up, both these extraordinary phenoms. Right? They're sort of like the, the seven-foot basketball player born in the inner, inner city. They've got this extraordinary talent. And they're able to make things go, make things work that never do for other people until they become president, until they become president. The individual talent, and these were remarkably talented figures, is undone by the amount of responsibility they have. And in fact, as I quote, you can see them both saying that, experiencing that, as they get into this office. Being governor of Arkansas or a senator from Illinois was no preparation, no preparation at all for this office. So if I'm right, if I'm right, the problem is not just the man or the woman, the problem is the office post 45, that the office grows to serve American interests relatively well for 150 years, but then that historical story, like every rise and fall, reaches a tipping point and tips in the other direction. Growth is good to a point. More power is good to a point, and then it becomes self-defeating. And that's in the structure of the office as much as it is in the practice of policy outside the office. If that's right, or even partially right, and by the way, I think that's a problem we have in all of our lives. 
Like presidents, we can spend all of our days answering email. We're so powerful. We're connected to so many people, right? We can do so many things but get nothing done, right? Americans now tend to work twice as hard as their grandparents do, and it's not clear they're accomplishing twice as much, even as much, right? So it's a problem we all face of scale and scope. If I'm right, um, there are some ways we could think differently about the office, um, and these thoughts are less well-researched because they're looking forward. So these are thoughts. Take them as you will. One, I do think less is more. I do think less is more. The rhetoric of our political campaigns is to say we'll do more and more. You get elected because you'll do more and more. And in fact, recently you, you claim you do everything on all sides, for all people, at all times. Uh, perhaps we as a society should ask for the opposite, for less. Perhaps we should ask, what do you think are the most important issues, uh, Miss Candidate or Mr. Candidate? And what are you going to do about those few things? It's striking to me, and this is not just the problem of the media, nor just the problem of uh, our candidates, it's a problem of us, that we spend our campaigns now more than ever before asking how the issue we care about will be resolved, not about what's important for the country. And that is a change in the tone of our politics that is not simply driven by the media, because I see this in my students as well. It's all about me. Right? What is this class going to do for me? I've now started telling my students, this class is going to do nothing for you. This class is going to, this is about education, right? If you want to be educated, that's fine. If you don't want to be educated, don't take the class. It's not about you. I'm not getting you a job. You don't come to university for me to get you a job. You come to university to be educated, right? So there is something about our larger culture that's a problem here. Please don't ask me how to solve that. I don't know. <laughs> but I do think that's part of the problem here, that less is more, but we're looking for more, and we're looking for more for each individual. And perhaps our technology encourages that, but I think that's an excuse. I think that's an excuse. I, I really think this is a baby boomer problem. Because when I see this in my students, it's actually coming from their parents, not from them. So my students get really interested in helping the world. And then their parents tell them, no, you're there to get a job. And I'm constantly struggling with this. Every major university I know, from the University of Texas, the University of Virginia, to Yale, to Harvard, to Stanford, has declining liberal arts majors. I don't think people are less interested in the liberal arts. I think they're going to college now to get a job, not to actually make themselves and the world better. And I don't think you can blame the media for that. All right, so now we've solved that problem. Second, second suggestion, second suggestion, uh, and this runs directly against what we're doing today. So again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I was going to use a different metaphor. I'll just say I'm, I'm singing in the, in the hills. No one's going to hear me. Um, is actually we need more facts. People need to know what they're talking about. People need to know what they're talking about. And we need to support institutions that create knowledge. We need to support institutions that create knowledge. Yes, there's a lot of intentional fake news. And yes, it's not entirely new, though the scale of it has certainly grown and it's more disguised than ever. But the real problem, I think, that no one wants to talk about, who talks about fake news, is that we have systematically underfunded the institutions and structures that give us knowledge. Universities, objective think tanks, not think tanks funded by particular families. Objective think tanks, what do I mean by that? I mean things like the Congressional Research Service the Government Accounting Office. These institutions have done a pretty good job. In fact, I'd put their record up against many others, right? Our public universities, of course, national public radio, public television. I, I know in certain audiences this sounds like I'm a communist. Um, but these knowledge-based institutions provide a basis for leaders to actually differentiate what's real and what's not. And if we continue to underfund those, we contribute to the mess that all leaders confront. I see this, I tell you honestly, with my, even my wife, who's a city council person in Austin right now. One of, I call her one of the members of the Politburo in Austin. <laughs> there are not enough uh, institutions providing in a city with a major research university and the state capital for big, big problems. They can't get basic facts. My wife's a PhD. She knows the difference between a fact and fake news. She sees the fake news all around, she can't get facts. We don't know in Austin 
actually how many people are malnourished. There are a lot of people malnourished in the city of Boston. We don't know. We don't have anyone who really objectively studies that. We don't actually know how many homeless people there are in Austin. Right? We have think tanks and groups that are coming up with numbers, and you look at their methodology, and it stinks. It wouldn't pass any PhD exam. Why are we not funding institutions to seriously study these problems? It is actually so cheap. It costs next to nothing. That's the other irony, right? You cut that and you save nothing. You cut that and you save nothing. By the way, George Washington argued from his first day in office for the creation of a national university for this point. I think we were better off having state universities, but this was actually something Washington saw himself. Third suggestion I make, uh, where, you know, now we're going to the not even imaginable in the United States, but here we go. Um, I think that the logic of the history shows that though the founders wanted an individual to do this job, the job has now become too great for an individual. And I think there is wisdom. I didn't think this when I started this project. But I now think, after doing all this research and writing, there is a lot of wisdom in a system like perhaps the German or French system that has divided responsibility between a president and a prime minister or a president and a Bundeskanzler. Why? Because you can separate the duties a bit. The head of state duties actually take much more time than we as policy scholars uh, recognize. When you look at the calendars, you see how much time presidents are spending entertaining, visiting dignitaries and sports teams and others. Um, and the policy jobs have gotten more and more difficult. I am absolutely certain that President Barack Obama would have been a better president if he actually had a prime minister to help manage Congress. Now, you might say Joe Biden was doing that. The problem is, since we changed the way the vice president is chosen, the vice president has no legitimacy in that role. No one elects the vice president. No one elects the vice president. And they have no legitimacy. It was funny to watch Mike Pence trying to do this with the health care debate, right? He has no legitimacy. In fact, he's less powerful in the Senate now that he's left the Senate, right? Uh, we need a figure uh, not chosen by a quorum of one party, but a figure who can play a legislative leadership role, just as we need a head of state. And how we would manage that, I'm not exactly sure. But that looks a lot better to me now. And in fact, we're an anomaly. We don't realize that. We're so narcissistic, right? We're an anomaly. Almost every other major democracy does this. Almost every major corporation I know does this. Every major university does this. Why don't we? Why are we a single executive? What, what is so sacrosanct uh, about that? How we get beyond that is another story, uh, but I'm just a historian. Uh, so um, I will leave it at that. I did want to, I have a whole set of implications for policy. I don't want to go on too long because I want to hear from all of you, but I do want to make one point actually on that. I had six, but I'm just going to make one. Um, and I think it's an important way in which we can educate as scholars the, the public, uh, and I think they might listen to us on this one. Uh, at least since I can remember, I don't know historically when this really begins, uh, but at least since I can remember, there's been a great um, value in claiming you're an outsider. I imagine you could date that back to Andrew Jackson, claiming you're an outsider when running for office, right? I'm not one of those corrupt insiders, I'm an outsider. For the presidency, at least, I think my book pretty definitively shows that if you're an outsider, you cannot do the job. You just cannot. Those who are insiders are hardly prepared. And there are different kinds of insiders who might be appropriate. But the level of understanding for the institutions, for the policy matters, for the processes, for the range of actors, takes even those who are enormously talented and on the inside an entire eight years to learn, if they learn it. How can someone from the outside come and do that? And I think that was a problem for Obama, just as it's a huge problem for the current president. And I think maybe we could help here. Maybe we can help educate citizens on why being an outsider sounds nice, but probably isn't. This isn't an argument for just someone who spent their entire life in politics, but it is to say someone with experience in public service, someone experience in large public institutions, someone with experience in policy, and someone with experience in an executive role where you have large amounts of responsibility and very little day-to-day -day authority, that would actually be incredibly valuable when we think about who should take on this office. As I watch Rex Tillerson struggle, as an understatement as Secretary of State, it's, it's enlightening for us, right? 
He was, by all accounts, a pretty good CEO of Exxon. Not at state. Yet, at least, right? And I think it's not because he's a bad person. These are fundamentally different jobs. Fundamentally different jobs. We need to educate the public about what it takes to be president. And we've done a poor job, uh, at least until now. Thank you. We now have a bit of time for questions. Our ground rules are simple. Please wait for the microphone to reach you. Uh, use the microphone since we're also uh, being uh, taped here. Uh, and please identify yourself when you get the microphone. I'm going to preempt and ask the first question. <laughs> I knew you would, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Prerogative of the co-chair. The argument of the book you know, rests upon the evolving demands on the presidency. And presidents have too little time to do their job properly. They're overworked and, as a result, underprepared on various issues. One could argue that, I don't know, Kennedy had some time in some evenings yes, yeah. uh, to, to study up on things when he wasn't, uh, or that our current president has, let's see, lots of time when he could turn off cable news um, and or stop holding rallies to actually read a document that was longer than one page. So, in each case, there's a little bit of time, more for the current president than perhaps yes. Kennedy. Absent in the book, and I think you do this by design, are notions of politics and ideology. Right. So it's structure, 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 but what they're actually trying to accomplish is secondary to structure and the demands and the time on the office. Correct. And I kept wondering as I was reading why politics doesn't quite fit in. So whether it's about Kennedy and civil rights, it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of his heart's not in the issue, right. uh, and he has a recalcitrant Congress that is making his life very difficult. He could read all of the books or op-eds by Martin Luther King that, that uh, are coming out of the press, and he still would have a problem. Or if you take, and this is my last example, Lyndon Johnson on Vietnam, you talk quite persuasively about just how exhausted the man is and how hard he works. But in the end, you say most debilitating was Johnson's inability to explain what he was doing. He had good reasons for all of his actions. He failed to tell a compelling story. One could argue that the story wasn't compelling mm -hmm. uh, and that he himself knew, as you say in the book, it's like, we can't win this. Right. So that could be a compelling story, but it's one that would work against then what he's trying to accomplish, which is to stave off what he sees as a political disaster. I will be labeled as the man who lost Vietnam uh, in a way that uh, uh, you know, Truman uh, lost China. So politics, politics, politics. Yeah. Why doesn't that factor in here? Why was this left out by design? That's, that's a great question. Um, in, in part, I, I probably overcompensated because I think what, what you describe is, tends to be what gets more of the emphasis, but maybe rightfully so. Uh, but, but here's what I came to see reading the primary materials. I think these issues are less clear. They're less black and white. So yes, you have presidential preferences that matter, you have presidential prejudices, you have presidential comfort and discomfort with certain issues. Um, but actually, I think in the day-to-day, -day, the politics matter a lot less than the structure does. Because if you take Kennedy and civil rights at some point, yes, his heart is not in it in the way Lyndon Johnson's is, but Kennedy also realizes he needs to do something. And that's actually where most presidents come out on most issues, right? It's actually the exceptional issue where their heart is in it and that's what they're doing. It's more often they've got a problem that's unsolvable and they're trying to find some way forward. And I think we as historians looking back uh, oversimplify this by making it about what, what was the president on board with this issue? Did he care about civil rights or not? Did he have an idea? Did he know what he was doing in Vietnam or not? Uh, of course that matters, but I actually think it matters less. It matters less than the ways in which the president tries to navigate in what mostly are problems for which there is not an easy yes or no answer and for which there isn't a solution. I mean, that's the, the point I try to make to undergraduates all the time, that even though in your essay you might have a thesis about whether to go into Afghanistan or not, the reality of policy is in the middle space. 
right? It's very difficult to choose one or the other, and most people ha are most presidents actually are are divided in their own thinking. So Kennedy again, I think, is a good example. Kennedy supports civil rights, not as much as Johnson did, but he's also very wary of going in and putting his political capital on the line here. So it's not that he's opposed to civil rights, it's not that he's in favor of civil rights, he's in between. He's stuck in between and he's trying to navigate that space. That's where I think Franklin Roosevelt was on these issues. So I, I'm wary of our overstating this issue, but I think your point is, is, is well taken and um, I would hope it goes hand in hand with the argument I'm making. Great, let's open it up for questions and comments. Um, go over here first and for the way around. Thank you very much. I'm Benjamin to a retired bureaucrat. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Right. Uh, you began by saying that we're in a time of presidential crisis. I think one could argue that we really are in a time of congressional crisis. And this has been demonstrated in recent days by the president's ability to work with the opposition party leaders and solve several rather important issues. Uh, the same could almost be said about the health care issue, which Congress failed to solve, as well as DACA, which the president has put into Congress's lap. Uh, the governors are doing fine. The uh, Justice Supreme Court system and, and the federal system and others is also doing well. The real problem seems to me to be Congress. Sure, um, and I, last I checked, I think it was yesterday, Congress's approval rating is like 9%. So Trump is a lot more popular than Congress is, uh, obviously. So yes, uh, and I share your frustration that I heard in your voice uh, with the way Congress has behaved, and I would argue this is a long-term process uh, that begins actually during the Cold War when Congress decides it's not going to take a role in many foreign policy decisions where it should, should play a role. Um, but I think the part about presidential crisis is crucial because historically, it seems to me, we've had other moments of difficulty with Congress. And we've generally, the president has generally been one of the navigators for us through that. And we've reached a time now where that's not the case. And so maybe what's making this presidential crisis so significant is that it's combined with a, with a congressional crisis. Um. Okay. Yeah, over there. <clears throat> uh, excellent talk. Uh, one, uh, uh, please state your name. And the microphone. Observation is that you get one second. There are two kinds of, of men, uh, and, well, I'm, about men I include Hillary, who run for pre have run for president. Those who are absolutely convinced that have that the this stupendous job is well within their capability. Reagan is one example, Obama, and then there are others dwarfed by the possibility of the office who God only knows why, what Dukakis would have done had he been elected. Jimmy Carter seemed overwhelmed by day one, and given that people vote, they must, to get the office, one must get a, the elect, a majority of the electoral college, and to get the elected, one must have delusion, some delusions of grandeur, yes, not yes. megalomania. Yes. The, a, a, uh, due modesty is, is not going to get one elected. And also, I'd point out that uh, sometimes an outsider is what is needed. Buchanan had the far better resume than Lincoln, but was a flaming disaster. The other key change you haven't mentioned is the absolute polarization. Yeah. For most of our lives, Americans would smugly say to Europeans, you know, your, you, you, your parties are in different universes, whereas when, uh, with our Democrats and Republicans, they can eventually shake hands and work something out. But that is no longer the case. Even the Supreme Court, nominees for the court are, are culled from two separate universes. And um, almost as hard, fewer people vote for the nominees of the opposing party. Yeah. No, this, these, are great, these are great points and questions. Um, one of the reasons I should have said this, I'm glad you brought this up. I, I do mention this in the book, but I probably should, said, should have said more about this in the book, too. One of the reasons that the founders didn't want presidential candidates to campaign was for this reason. Right? They were supposed to be, and it was always a myth, the myth of being called to service. 
rather than seeking it out. And I think it was about this point of maintaining modesty. Uh, I think there's no doubt that our presidential campaign process, as it's become more, uh, more unending and more uh, about promising and connecting with people than it's ever been before, um, it leads one to have to be an egomaniac to go through this, right? And that then produces a debilitated person. In some moments, I've actually thought we are, by definition, electing psychotic narcissists. <laughs> Right, to go through this process. If you think of, if you think of what Hillary, and, and, uh, Don, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump went through the last uh, two years. Um, so I think that is a, pro a problem in our process. Uh, and by the way, I think that happens with lots of leaders of organizations today. I look at the university presidents of 50 years ago and I look at them today and the university presidents today have to be egomaniacs too. How else are you going to get people to give you millions of dollars at dinner every night? Right? Um, so I do think this is a structural problem. In terms of polarization, as you know, I mean, we've had many moments of uh, polarization uh, in our society, and it's not clear to me this is necessarily worse than some of the others. Um, but I do think in other moments of polarization, we did have certain figures who managed to stand above and bring people together. Not always. Uh, Congress, under Jackson's presidency, was incredibly polarized, right? Um, but I do think we've had figures who were able uh, to do that, and uh, we lack that today, not because we lack, lack talent, we lack the mechanism for doing that. We lack people who, who are trained uh, to do that, it seems to me. A very good presentation. I'm Jim Jones. Um, having a career, starting the career at the White House and the Johnson administration, oh, wow. being his last appointment secretary, uh, you didn't mention, maybe you do in the book, he also realized this job was yes. too big and too yes. exhausting. He recommended and was serious about it. Uh, the president had one term only, and one of the counter arguments was you become a, um, a uh, uh, impotent president from the beginning. Right, lame duck. Right, and one of the things that we found that was in 68 until the convention actually nominated Hubert Humphrey, he did not lose power. He was able to get through a lot of legislation through the Congress. And so I would just be curious as to your impression of, uh, of a one-term presidency and not be reelected. And the second point, I think you made a very important point, uh, having been in elective office myself, is incredibly people are elected and they try to represent the the viewpoints that they perceived in the election. And what I see today is an awful lot of ignorance and uh, not a respect for, for facts, as you mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And so I think that really, if you look at the problems of Congress, you look at the problems of the presidency, it is reflective of us as a country, or an awful lot of us. So I'd be curious as to your comments on that. Sure, sure. So on the first point, and I, I, I do quote Johnson on that a little bit, your point of him saying that, uh, about the exhaustion. Uh, I don't, I, I haven't found too much evidence of him thinking about one term, but I'm sure you're right that that's what he was uh, thinking about. I, I, I agree with your point, though, that if you um, are in office and everyone knows when your time ends, you do lose a lot of leverage. So I would be wary of that, and second term presidents struggle with this, right? Their presidency in some ways is over after, after two years. Um, after the years five and six. So I don't think that's necessarily a good, a good idea to have only one term. Uh, but I do think, and again, I know why this doesn't happen, it would be great if we had presidents who aren't committed to a second term, right? And recognized how much they can do and how, how monumental the office is in one term. And this comes back to a problem of ego. Um, so it's hard not to, uh, in this sense, revere someone like James Polk, who says, I'm gonna do my one term and I'm gonna be out. Right? Uh, doesn't mean you don't want to leave that option open for leverage points, but it might make sense. Uh, and I'll tell you, after, I know why being president you develop a desire to serve a second term to fulfill your agenda, et cetera, but having spent time looking at the day to day, uh, and this is something we don't study enough, the, the health implications of being president are so grave. It's, it's amazing that anyone really wants to do it for more than four years. Most presidents are very unhappy in their second term. Very unhappy. Uh, Bill Clinton's happy at the end, but not through most of his second term, as you all, as you all remember. Now, in terms of um, uh, public ignorance, you know, it, this is a hard issue, right? Uh, I love the uh, New Yorker cartoon. I hope you all saw, saw where um, there's this guy on a plane. I feel like I'm doing stand-up comedy now. There's a guy on a plane, 
And he, he turns around, right? And he says, you know, he's scrunched up on a plane as all of us are, right? He turns around and says, I've had it. I'm not going to put up with these smug pilots anymore. I'm flying the plane. Who's with me? <laughs> and of course, no one is with him, right? It's interesting, right? So 40 to 50 years ago, large proportions of the American public did not trust flying. My grandparents never wanted to fly. They didn't trust it, right? Now most Americans are comfortable flying, or, or not comfortable, trust, <laughs> trust flying, right? So we do trust those facts, right? I don't know who the pilot is. It could be some liberal from Austin, right? I don't know who the public, I don't know who the pilot is. I don't know what his background is. Somehow, I don't even know how he's been educated, I don't know nothing, but yet I trust my life to this person. So in some ways, we're more trusting of facts, right? The fact that the plane will take off and on, which still is counterintuitive to me. I cannot explain to my children how it works, right? But yet, I trust it. But for some reason, I don't trust a scientist when the scientist tells me that we're getting worse storms because the water is warmer, and that's related to global warming, and that's why we're destroying Houston and other cities like that, right? So I think this is selective ignorance. Selective ignorance, and I think it's actually driven more by the outcomes we want less than the ignorance itself. So my sneaking suspicion is that most climate deniers are denying climate change because they don't like what acknowledging climate change would mean. And that's all the more reason why we need to have more investment in institutions that create legitimacy for these facts so they're undeniable. So that they're undeniable. Thank you. Let's take a question in the back. Yeah, John? Yeah. Yep. Sure. Dr. Hunt. <laughs> Thanks. Just Jonathan Hunt. Dr. Hunt has stole my father. Oh. But <laughs> uh, from the University of Southampton, I, I was curious about how you would define success for a president or for the office of the presidency. And I was curious, particularly in relation to one of the cases that you don't discuss. Now, it's an easy criticism to make for a book that covers 45 case studies that you didn't look at each and every case study. But for the post-war in particular, what do you make of, say, Fred Greenstein's argument about the hidden hand presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower? Uh, how would you define success, and would that include Eisenhower, who perhaps didn't have the domestic accomplishments uh, of an LBJ, but who nonetheless presided over a piece of uh, a period of relative peace and yeah. prosperity and yeah. plenty for the American people? That's a great question, and and I, I, I am selective, as one of my political science uh, colleagues told me. You're, you're selecting on the dependent variable. I don't even know what that means, but I'm sure it's. I'm sure I've done it. <laughs> I'm sure I've done it. <laughs> Whatever they say I've done, I've done it. Um, uh, and, and I don't talk, I, I mention Eisenhower a bit, but I don't in this book, though of course I've written about him elsewhere, I don't talk a lot about Eisenhower here. Uh, you could make the argument, and I think there's a lot, uh, and, and you and Mel Leffler and others have argued for many of the successes that Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower have. I think the Marshall Plan's a great success, and Harry Truman deserves a lot of credit uh, for that. I think the interstate highway system, even though it had enormous negative implications, I think on a certain ways it was a success, and Eisenhower deserves credit for that. And we could go on and on uh, with this. So I don't mean to say that uh, all the presidents after Roosevelt were without success. But I do think, and I take this from Eisenhower's farewell address, I do think that presidents after Roosevelt recognized uh, that there were huge issues that they needed to address that they were unable to address issues that became perhaps ticking time bombs. That's how I read Eisenhower's farewell address, right? We've created this military industrial complex. It's maybe served us now, but this is actually not the transformation we need for our democracy. And it's a lament, right? So it doesn't mean he's not successful in other areas. And it doesn't even mean he's not successful in managing it in his own time. But he recognizes that he, he has left a very troubled legacy to his successors. Now, maybe that's true for all presidents, but I think in the eyes of these presidents themselves, there were big issues they were unable to address, even though they seemed to have so much more power and the expectations were so much higher. So I'm not saying all presidents have been unsuccessful, and I'm certainly not saying they were bad presidents, but I am saying that the office was more constrained than they expected it would be, and many things they wanted to do, they were unable to do. Center. Uh, Dave Smith, um, you know, I was at a meeting of, at the, uh, in which the, the federal bank president in Dallas spoke. His name's President Kaplan. Uh, Kaplan. And um, he spoke about that we were at the end of a, of a super cycle in debt. And the question I have for you, the question I have for you 
is um, we, we seem to have so many pigs at the trough, right, that our ability to maneuver is dramatically reduced. Is there any difficulty for the president to, to, to maneuver in this environment with so much debt? So the, the debt question is something I've thought a lot about, uh, but it's also, as you know, I'm sure, Dave, so in, 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 in complex that I'm not sure I fully understand it myself. What's extraordinary is how cheap debt is for the U.S. now, in the sense how much flexibility we have, right? So everyone in this room knows that the Chinese paid for the war in Iraq, right? It's the, they bought our bonds, right? And yes, we owe them, but we denominate the bonds, so we could just print the dollars in theory, right? That, of course, would create all kinds of other implications, but it's, it's pretty extraordinary. I wish I could live that way, right? I just throw bonds out, get cash from people, and you know, then say, I will, I will print the money to pay you back when I want. So in a certain way, debt, uh, in an unprecedented way, the British Empire never was able to do this, it has really allowed the United States to, enormous flexibility and allowed us to shop while we fight war which, as I, was argue, as I argued in the, in the Washington Post today, really is a real problem that we've lost this sense of shared sacrifice. Um, so I think it's actually given us a lot of uh, flexibility. But the other part of your question is also right, too, that it's empowered so many people to ask for things. Um, and it's not the problem of finance in our political system now is not just the people putting money in. It's in the demands that are taken out. Um, and I really think we've got to get beyond this question of big government and small government because there's no one arguing for small government, really. Uh, le let me tell you, give you another Texas story, right? We have a, a, a state run by people who claim they're all about small government. They were suing Obama every day, right? Now what are they doing? They're initiating legislation to constrain the cities. They're now telling us which trees we can chop down and which they can't. The Republicans in the state legislature, they're not about small government. Uh, and why are they doing that? Well, because there are interests coming to them who want to be served by those decisions that they make. It's what I'm talking about and what I think you mean by pigs at the trough. Uh, executive offices that are now overrun by claimants on them, claimants who executives feel they have to satisfy. So instead of making policy for the state or the nation, you're making policy for one group and another group and another group and another group. It's, it's the worst kind of pluralism. Uh, and by the way, uh, I think, and, and I think this comes through in the book, the recipients of welfare payments are as much the corporations as they are the citizens. There's no one who's against welfare. It's a question about whose, whose welfare, right? We're debating in Austin, Texas now how much money to give Amazon to move to Austin, right? Uh, but we don't call that welfare. But we call it welfare if we were giving money to African-American families to have houses, right? Why is one welfare and one the other? I think this is relevant for our point, because that's what executives are dealing with on a day-to-day on a -day basis. Hello. Thank you. So Marty Sherwin. <laughs> Professor Sherwin. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I'm convinced that uh, your basic thesis is correct. Uh, and I just want to uh, sort of <laughs> no, I I just want you know want to ask you a question about its construction. Um, it seems to me that if you look at the whole span of American history, we see many divides, but one great divide: World War II. After that, foreign policy in uh, American history is huge, and before that, it was small. Absolutely. This government was created for domestic politics, not for foreign policy. So that's really the huge problem that we have. How are you gonna fix that? <laughs> so I'm so glad you put it that way because now at all future events, I'm gonna say it that way because I actually argue, I actually say that early in the book. I think that's entirely correct. You, you knew this a long time ago. It took me a while to realize this. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. And in fact, I take it one step further. Our democratic theory, the theory behind our government, also presumes that domestic policy is the dominant element, right? And also presumes that we are not an empire, right? So, and you could say, yeah, we had the Philippines on the way, but we, when we're talking about the scale post-World War II, for all the reasons you've written about, we're on a totally different dimension, and our theory does not match that as well. So I think that's entirely right. And I think the only way we can begin to fix that is not to have another constitutional convention. Boy, would that be a disaster. Right? But to actually begin to talk seriously about reforming some of these offices and get people in these offices who are thinking about that. 
Part of the job of the president, I think this is what Obama was trying to tell Trump in his letter, is not just to be a shepherd of democratic institutions, but to help them evolve. There is a kind of paternalistic element, right? Just as we all try to help our families evolve over time, you're trying to help these offices evolve. And I think the criticism has to go to both sides for not, not wanting to engage uh, in that and instead fetishizing these false historical images of these, of these offices. So I, I'm with you 100%, Marty. And then, and then we'll go to the lady in front. Okay. Uh, Robert Harris, uh, Professor Emeritus Cornell University. Uh, first of all, Roosevelt, I wonder, he was uh, more effective as a president. He had more years in the office than anyone else. If others had had, had, had as many years, maybe they would have been uh, as effective as Roosevelt. Uh, but you talk about uh, one possible remedy of having a prime minister. What if we had more effective cabinet members? And is there any uh, comparison between, uh, let's say, the cabinet members that Roosevelt had, the cabinet members that Truman had, or any of the other presidents? Okay. So I, I initially, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Harris, for the, those questions. I initially thought that that was part of the answer, the cabinet members. And the original book proposal actually had a whole section on that. Uh, and I came to realize, uh, as I did the research, that actually the way cabinet members have been used has widely varied, and generally they have not been very po powerful. I mean, Roosevelt's cabinet members had hardly any power, right? He, Cordell Hull was not making foreign policy, even though he was Secretary of, of State. Sometimes Roosevelt informed him what he had done. Uh, but rarely was Cordell Hull at the center of, of Roosevelt's foreign policy making. And Dean Rusk uh, is important in the 60s, but certainly if you want to understand American foreign policy, it's not really about Dean Rusk. People like George Bundy and presidents and others, Robert McNamara, are much more important. So I think the, um, and, and NSC advisors, by the way, are not cabinet officials, right? So I think the, the cabinet is, is really the creature of the president. And I don't think that's actually a bad thing. Uh, but I think what we now have is, and this is a relatively new phenomenon, I think from Al Gore's vice presidency, we now in essence have two cabinets, because now the vice president creates his own cabinet. And so if it's not bad enough that we have the cabinet and then the NSC, we just make it infinitely more and more complex. And the vice president's national security advisor is fighting with the president's national security advisor who's fighting with the secretary of state. Um, so I think actually empowering the cabinet could possibly make things worse. I think we'd be better off with fewer recognizable, accountable principles. Uh, and this is where Congress comes in, because I think Congress needs to play its role here as well. Right? So I think accountable to Congress and accountable to the electorate, and fewer of them who we can see. And we can, we can, we can recognize what they're doing. Uh, and you're right, Roosevelt had more years, but I think his more years in office also sometimes made it harder for him. As you know, uh, it destroyed his health, and his effectiveness was, was erratic. Right? His New Deal effectiveness was much better in the first term than at the second and third term. And his presidential leadership effectiveness, I think, was far more effective in the early in 41, 42, 43 than 44 and 45. So, so even there, we see variation. You could argue Roosevelt both ways. More years gave him more time, but it also debilitated him much more. Thank you. Yep. Um, Sharon White, uh, I used to be a historian, my doctorate's in history, but I then went into diplomacy and have just finished a career there. Um, thank you for an interesting presentation. I'm interested in or thinking about your solution section. I'm wondering if the very interesting structural issues you raise are really the core, though, of where the solutions could come from, and wonder about what role you give to sort of larger forces, whether they're technological or, in particular, globalization, for example, that have shifted some of the power interests of ex-governmental power groups so that where there was a large overlap with national interests, good governance, and power elites, now under globalization there may be less of an overlap. And that therefore there are some sort of concerted forces that want maybe not a smaller government, but a weaker government or more easily controlled uh, advocacy for the public good. So I'm just interested in, in whether some of the solutions and sort of how you've used those issues. 
It's a, it's a great point. It's why the solutions are so difficult, because the point of agency for the president, which I've already problematized, is even more problematized for this reason. So one of the things I do talk about, and you as an ambassador, would, uh, diplomat, would know this, uh, is that there are more and more international actors. It's not just more countries as, and, and, and a wider scope, as, as uh, Marty was talking about, but it's also that you have sub-state actors uh, and business actors. Uh, and that's part of what globalization is. So there's a much more complex space that the president is operating in and a much larger range of uh, people he's negotiating with. And I think that's part of what's contributing to the overwhelming nature of the office and the fragmentation uh, of the office. But I think that these powers, these processes of globalization have in some ways changed the nature of state power. But uh, big state actors like the president of the United States are still enormously powerful and in some ways more powerful than ever before. What's, what's, um, what I'm still getting my arms around and my head around is the fact that now the President of the United States can decide whose house will be bombed, and we will actually bomb it with reasonable accuracy, often with the unintended effects of <laughs> angering the very people we're trying to appeal to, right? So I'm not advocating that. But that kind of power, you could say, yeah, presidents are less powerful because there are all these other actors. On the other hand, I mean, that power of targeted killing that Obama used, we're not talking about Trump here. We're talking Obama, right? Uh, that's startling. No one else can do that. Don Wolfensberger, yeah. Thank you. Don Wolfensberger with the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm glad that you brought up Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. I had occasion recently to revisit the imperial presidency, and as you point out, it was published during Nixon's presidency, even though Schlesinger obviously had worked for Kennedy and Johnson and so on. But I think the point that he made that struck me was that it was almost a mea culpa for historians. He said that we historians have been guilty over the years of building up presidents and the presidency as sort of central to the American story. And as a result, we've created almost an impossible presidency in, in terms of carrying things out. And I think that's the point that you, that you made today. I guess I'm trying to reconcile in my mind your less is more point, how probably we should expect less of presidents, have them doing less, at the same time you know, big government is here to stay. And to me, that just means the demands are not going to go away. Can you sort of help me reconcile these two things? Yeah, I, I think um, I, in, a, in a way I'm making an argument for, for federalism, Don, right? So I think government is going to do a lot of things. Uh, look, I think government's going to have to get more involved in health care, not less. That's the reality of our world, right? Uh, but I'm not sure that it should be at the presidential level. Right? We should divide responsibility. The wisdom of the founders is that governing capacity increases when you have multiple layers of governance. And what we've done, actually, is we've centralized so much. We are far less federalist, lowercase f. And I think that's part of the problem. So it's not that government as a whole should do less. But we should think more clearly about where is the appropriate locus of authority for government to be doing uh, what it does. And, and, and here again, I'm very influenced by my wife's experience in city government, by my looking at what state governments do, and, and by our th my thinking about diplomacy also. I'm not sure presidential diplomacy is the right way to conduct diplomacy. I actually think diplomats should be delegated authority to be diplomats. All right, one of the problems every diplomat shares with me is that now they feel that Washington is, under, is going over their heads all the time when they're, when they're in the field. So my argument is not less government or more. It's the way we structure government, and it's about federalism. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Uh, extremely interesting. Um, so my question is... Could, could you state your name, please? Uh, Mishulam. Mishulam. I wonder if you kind of hint to kind of like a philosopher king of Plato, but rather a philosopher president who is able to separate himself from the day-to-day -day activities, look at the big picture, and be objective, even from his own prejudices. But at the same time, you need a day-to-day -day person that's constantly reacting as um, Obama and past post-war presidents have. Is that correct? Well, I think there's something to that. I think actually what you described is actually what the founders were looking for. The founders were in some ways quite platonic. Uh, and they couldn't agree on a lot of things, but they wanted someone. Uh, and the, I love the Gilbert Stuart portraits of Washington. This is exactly how Washington is depicted as a kind of philosopher king, but a philosopher king who comes from the people. So a philosopher king who's democratically accountable, but able to be a philosopher king. Um, I wouldn't use those terms for what I'm arguing for. I'm arguing for someone whose uh, job it is to, be is to be strategic and not tactical. And a, a way of thinking about what I'm arguing in military terms uh, is that the tactical is overwhelming the strategic, which is ironic uh, when we have so much power. 
uh, and we die a death of a thousand cuts. Right? Uh, and so that's, that's the argument there, that someone should be in a strategic position and should be, in essence, to come back to Don's point, they should be paid to be strategic, and someone else should be paid to be tactical. Of course, they have to communicate. Uh, but right now, the strategic is gone. I mean, this is what I think many of us find when we go in the archives. There really isn't strategy. And it's not because people don't think strategy is important. There's not time for it. It's so hard to do. It's hard to get everyone together. You get laundry lists rather than strategy. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Okay, we'll right here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, what, what exactly, Peter Gaiari, Peter de Gaiari, apologies. Uh, what exactly happened between 1959 and 1961 <laughs> with the calendar, uh, the, the Truman Eisenhower years to the Kennedy Johnson years? That's very interesting, actually. It went from so quiet to yep. hyper. Thank you. So, I mean, it's, it's a little bit, I, I, it's not that it, you know, it's an on and off switch, but there is definitely a phase difference. And I think it's generational. I think it's generational. Uh, the, the world of Roosevelt and um, Truman and Eisenhower was a world where leaders, CEOs, generals, presidents, um, it was a clubby world, and it was a world where you were not expected to be a workaholic. You were not expected to know everything. You were expected to preside and pontificate and be a philosopher king a little more than a day-to-day -day manager. I don't think Eisenhower thought of himself as a manager. The whole point of the hidden hand that um, Jonathan brought up was that he wasn't managing. He was actually moving the discussion along, right? Uh, and Truman didn't think of himself uh, as a manager either. And I think um, what changes from 59 to 60, 61 are, of course, the expectations on the office, but also the ways the office is self-conceptualized and the ways presidents sell themselves. So I actually spent some time going back and rereading, I read these before, lots of Kennedy's campaign speeches. And what he's basically criticizing Eisenhower for is being a fuddy-duddy, right? He's saying, this guy is not really managing things. You need a smart, energetic person who will be in there, you know, moving the gears. And that's what the calendar, that's what the calendar reflects. And, and we haven't moved away from that, and I'll say something beyond that. I think the more we valorize these sort of super leaders, we're encouraging exactly, exactly that. Right? Uh, so that's, that's, I think, where the, where the shift uh, occurs. It's interesting that Ronald Reagan, I think, self-consciously wanted to go back to the fuddy-duddy world. Ronald Reagan was a fuddy-duddy, right? He wanted to go back to that world, but he couldn't. The office wouldn't allow him. That's what made that part of the story so, so interesting. Clinton wanted to be in this world, right? This is, this is Clinton's great, this is, what, this is what Clinton wants. He wants to be on the phone at 2 a.m., kibitzing with someone, right? But Reagan wanted to go back, and he couldn't. And so it's not just about the man after a while. It becomes the way the office is structured itself. On that note, I'm going to invite you all to a reception uh, outside uh, next door uh, in about uh, one minute. Um, I will call your attention to next week's speaker on September 18th at 4 o'clock. Melissa Stockdale will be speaking on her book, Mobilizing the Russian Nation, Patriotism and Citizenship uh, in the First World War. Thank you to our participants. Thank you to Jeremy Surrey.